Good evening. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presidential debate presented by Charlotte Latin School's Speech and Debate Team. I had the recent opportunity in a Zoom call to answer tough questions presented by the 18 people who were involved in tonight's discussion. On Tuesday, November 3rd, Americans have the opportunity to exercise one of our most treasured rights, the right to vote. These students showed intellect, they showed maturity, they showed a grasp of issues, and more than anything, they showed respect and civility toward me and with each other. The 18 students participating in this debate have worked diligently to gather factual information about critical choices facing our country to shape that evidence into strong arguments using reason and to present their points with civility. And that more than anything else is, we need in our, is what we need in our nation. And we need in our city and we need in our state respect and civility toward each other, even when we disagree with each other. Encouraging civility is, after all, a goal named in Charlotte Latin School's mission statement. Indeed, in these times of great uncertainty and strife in our nation, we should all reflect on how we can engage each other respectfully and hear each other more compassionately. That's the best of America and that's the best of North Carolina. And these students showed me the respect, even when I could tell they were disagreeing with some of my answers. We need to continue to challenge each other and think about the future, the future generations and how they're gonna continue to have the incredible quality of life that we have in what we call the United States of America. Civil discourse is the lifeblood of democracy. We must remember one of the most effective ways to win hearts and minds is to give all sides the opportunity to have their voices heard instead of name calling, marginalizing, or silencing our opponents. The United States of America is still a great and new and modern experience and experiment. And we've got to understand that and we've got to respect that because a lot of people have fought for this freedom that we have in this great country. Our decisions are almost always questions of advantages and disadvantages, not referenda on good and evil. So often, it is our children who show us what is truly important. Let their presentation tonight reawaken us to our responsibilities as citizens and inspire us to continue the work of making America a more perfect union. Thank you for watching. Enjoy tonight's competition of ideas. So uh, have a great time tonight. Show respect and civility for each other and have an understanding where each viewpoint is coming from. That's the best of North Carolina, and that's also the best of Charlotte Latin, civility, which is one of your core values. Congratulations. On behalf of the students, parents, faculty, and administration, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation of our community presidential debate. I'm Jonathan Peel, the director of speech and debate here at Latin. And what we're doing this evening is about many things, but among them is showcasing our school's commitment to civility and civil discourse that is enshrined in our mission and critical to the work of any debate program, the idea that important public policy decisions should be informed by data and evidence. This evening, you'll see 18 of more than 70 members of the speech and debate team here at Latin arguing both sides of three important questions facing our country ranging from healthcare policy to police reform and environmental regulation and how that interacts with our economic well-being. These students have worked tirelessly over the last several weeks to prepare their arguments for this evening. And we hope that that leaves you, after you're done watching, a little bit better informed. When it does so, we call on you to engage and go vote on November 3rd. And tonight's presentation will end with some important information about how you can go and do that. So enjoy tonight's presentation, approach it with an open mind, and admire the hard work that these students have put in. We believe that if anything else, it will leave you more hopeful for our nation's future. Thank you and good night.
America spends more on healthcare than any nation in the world, yet among developed nations, we rank last in life expectancy and second to last in child mortality. To heal our sick healthcare system, the Biden-Harris ticket and the Democratic Party affirm that the US federal government should provide a public option health insurance plan. This plan would provide two main benefits. First, the public option health plan would increase access to necessary medical care and save lives. Coverage gains from the Affordable Care Act are eroding. A 2020 study from The Lancet reports that nearly 80 million Americans do not have adequate health insurance. And in 2017, almost half of all Americans were unable to handle a $400 medical expense. For those without insurance, these expenses have life-altering consequences, as most in this group have low or moderate incomes. A startling 67% of all personal bankruptcies are tied to medical issues. And bankruptcy has severe long-term consequences. By dropping people's credit scores, bankruptcies can reduce their ability to qualify for loans, force them to sell assets like their houses and cars, and prevent them from landing jobs in the future. Altogether, healthcare expenses alone forced 8 million people into poverty just in 2018. The problem is only getting worse as premiums, deductibles, and out-of-pocket expenses are rising, far outpacing wage growth and inflation. As costs continue to rise, more Americans will suffer. Worse still, a 2009 study from the Harvard Medical School found that not having insurance makes a person more likely to skip necessary treatments, increasing their risk of death by 40%. In this way, lack of insurance kills nearly 45,000 people each year in America. Under our current healthcare system, millions of Americans find themselves between a rock and a hard place, forgo healthcare to avoid financial ruin or risk everything trying to stay alive. Enacting a public option health insurance plan means that millions of Americans don't have to make this difficult choice. After the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010 under Obama, the number of uninsured non-elderly Americans uh, dropped from 46.5 million to 27 million in 2016, almost a 40% drop. However, cuts made to Obamacare since 2016 have since increased the number of uninsured Americans by 1.4 million. Additionally, in the status quo, state politics are getting in the way of coverage for millions of low-income Americans. 14 states, including our home of North Carolina, has refused to take up the ACA's expansion of Medicaid eligibility, denying healthcare access to around 4.9 million adults. A public option will ensure these individuals get covered by offering premium free access for individuals who would be eligible for Medicaid if not for their state's inaction, ending surprise medical billing, negotiating lower drug prices, and ensuring the public option covers the full scope of Medicaid benefits. Uh, in addition to in addition to improving health and reducing medical costs, a public option, secondly, uh, would provide three major economic benefits. So first, a public option would reduce job lock, a phenomenon in which workers stay in positions for the sole purpose of maintaining their health coverage. A study by the Center for Economic Policy Research found that job lock reduces the rate of people leaving their jobs by up to 25%, fortunately by severing ties between insurance and employment. Employees will be free to find jobs that are more suitable for their skills. This is crucial as increasing job satisfaction increases productivity, which is a key driver of economic growth. Secondly, a public option is going to increase wages by providing government health care to all who want it, regardless of employment status. A public option plan would allow employers to, uh, to redirect their spending on workers' wages. In fact, Joe Stone, a professor at the University of Oregon, finds empirically that a $1 decrease to health benefits leads to a corresponding 83 cent increase in wages. This is critical as 157 million Americans currently receive health insurance through their work. Third and finally, a public option would help small businesses. Bivens of the Economic Policy Institute finds that entrepreneurship is low in the U.S. relative to other developed nations, and Dunkelberg reforms find that the most severe problems facing small businesses right now is the cost of health insurance, and its rising costs prevent them from offering health plans uh, to be competitive. Right, a public option would remove employer health insurance as, the re as a recruitment tactic, allowing for small businesses to hire more workers in the future. Small firms are uniquely critical to economic growth. They're more likely to innovate cost-saving strategies and new products that help improve economic productivity. In the US, our constitutional rights guarantee every American the right to life, liberty, and property. Our ailing healthcare system is depriving us of all three by forcing millions of Americans to choose between selling their assets to pay for life-saving medications or in removing their liberty of choice by forcing them to spend their savings just to stay alive. To give every American an equal opportunity to enjoy these fundamental rights, we urge you vote Biden-Harris in favor of a public option.
Sometimes the cure is worse than the disease. Because a public option would be a death sentence for quality care in the United States, join President Trump and the Republican Party in the, opposing the idea that the United States federal government should provide a public option health insurance plan. The first disadvantage of a government takeover of our healthcare system is that it would be catastrophically ineffective and astronomically expensive. Democrats argue that administrative costs and efficiency would lead to a simpler and cheaper system, but that neglects the bloat of bureaucracy and the laws of economics. Let's consider the failures of government programs. Fellow Americans, just take a moment to reflect on the last time you went to the DMV. How was your experience? Long? Tedious? If your answer is yes to both of these, you've discovered the fundamental issue with government control, ineffectiveness. Introducing state and federal government intervention is terrible for the efficacy of a critical system that involves the lives of Americans. An example of this is in Canada, where the average wait time is 20 weeks, compared to the US's wait times, which are 20 days. Governments are terrible at streamlining the health care of their citizens. And thankfully, in America, private insurance simply works better. The, but the, the future that the Democrats seek is far worse than just longer wait times. A public option will lead to a combination of massive new debt and tax increases. Tom Church of the Hoover Institution finds a public option would add over $700 billion to 10-year deficits. By 2049, the plan would increase long-run debt projections by 30% of GDP or require tax increases equal to nearly 20% of projected income tax revenue. These tax increases may affect even the middle-class income players payers, raising their marginal income tax rates by several percentage points. The plan's implicit subsidies would become the third largest item on the federal budget, behind only Medicare and Social Security. A second major disadvantage of a public option is that it will harm doctors. Here's how Medicare and government-run healthcare works. For every Medicare patient treated, the government pays a set fee, a rate for reimbursing doctors. Consistently, this reimbursement rate for doctors is extremely low for Medicare compared to private insurance. There would be no healthcare system without the hard work of doctors across the nation. Especially in a time of crisis like this, we must not reduce our support for the people on the front lines of the hospitals combating these diseases and viruses. This year, we have seen doctors and nurses throw themselves in front of a deadly virus for the welfare of the people. Now, imagine a world in which those on the front lines aren't even paid enough to save our country. Doctors are financially disincentivized to work because of the mass labor with pay that is disproportionate to the time and effort that they put in. The United Kingdom is an excellent example of what not to do. With a shortage of over 11,000 doctors, their care is hurting British citizens in the wake of a destructive pandemic. In the last six years, hundreds of surgical practices closed down, affecting 1.9 British, million British citizens, and it's only getting worse. With our strong healthcare system, we have the ability to reward hardworking doctors and improve the lives of millions of Americans. The Democrats want to take that away. A final major disadvantage of a public option is the harm it will do to uh, employment and to good benefits. The moment a public option is introduced, employers would lose the incentive to provide private health coverage, opting instead for a government-run system. This ignores the 71% of Americans that rate their private coverage excellent. Without employer-provided coverage, they'd be forced to register under an inefficient and failing system that hurts good Americans who deserve quality care. Not only does a public option hurt the 80 million Americans they say are uninsured with low quality health care, but it makes for an inefficient health care system that would inevitably affect the other 240 million Americans today. While I've spent the majority of this speech discussing the perils of the democratic position, it's important to understand that the Republican Party is helping. Here's how. Just two weeks ago, President Trump issued an executive order to protect pre-existing conditions and end surprise medical billing. On September 13th, the administration issued another executive order to reduce prescription drug prices in the US because we shouldn't be forced to pay more than other countries. Drug prices are decreasing as we speak. In May 2020, drug makers discounted brand name drugs by an average of 45% and prices for all drugs decreased under 
a Republican administration. Ronald Reagan famously once said, the nine most terrifying words in the English language are I'm from the government and I'm here to help. As Republicans, we acknowledge that the American healthcare system can and should be improved, but the cure can't be worse than the disease. The prescription to heal the American healthcare system isn't more government, it's deregulation and competition. Vote Republican and vote Trump Pence to stop the creeping socialism of American healthcare before it's terminal. Okay, so y'all tell us that the way to better healthcare is through like deregulation of the system. How are Republicans like doing this right now and has it actually helped at all? Okay, so there's two parts to your question. How are they doing it and has it helped? First, on is it like, how are they doing it? So the Trump administration has executive orders to do all of the stuff that you say, the net benefits of like, let's just say, um, in decreasing prescription drug prices and ending surprise medical billing, while also not including like massive amounts of government intervention and socializing healthcare. Because the fact of the matter is that a majority of Americans rate their private coverage as excellent in the status quo, and a majority of Americans would say that they don't want a government-sponsored healthcare. Because at the end of the day, government-sponsored healthcare is terrible and it's inefficient. So private insurance right now is being let run free and competition the status quo is improving the quality of care, which is why Americans on net support it. That's what the Trump administration is doing. Has it helped? Yes, because we read to you evidence that an overwhelming majority of Americans love their private insurance, and more importantly, that drug prices on net are decreasing as we speak. Can we ask you a question? Yes. Okay, so your argument at the top of your argument, like your position, is that covered gains are eroding and 80 million have inadequate health access. What does it mean for access to be inadequate? It means that the, a lot of people, first of all, don't have insurance at all. And second of all, the people who do have insurance, a lot of their plans don't cover some benefits they need. For example, they don't cover some prescription drugs and they don't cover some services that are necessary to maintain their life. Okay, so how does the public option reduce prescription drugs, for example? So in a public option, the government would negotiate lower drug prices with corporations in the same way that happens in a lot of countries that have single-payer systems, for example, the UK and Canada. The Republicans bring up a few issues with the public option, namely that it's expensive, hurts doctors, and would reduce employment benefits. Fortunately, most of the points they bring up amount to fear-mongering. Let's explore why. First, on the fear of cost. There are three main problems with this argument. The first is a principled one. The plan is fully feasible, and while it would entail increasing taxes, the majority of the burden would fall on the rich. We believe that while expense is certainly an important consideration, it is not sufficient reason to fail to enact legislation that would save thousands of lives every single year. Second, they fail to do the comparative. While implementing a public option is expensive, our current healthcare spending is unsustainable. As the cost of premiums, deductibles, and copays spiral out of control, some studies estimate that healthcare costs could account for a whopping 50% of the economy by 2060. While the Republicans have no plan to rein in costs, a public option offers a solution. The government will negotiate lower drug prices with producers and use its antitrust authority to tackle monopolistic practices while ensuring that every American who wants it has access to health insurance. Third, their argument is empirically untrue. Countries with government-run healthcare systems have lower expenses across the board. Healthcare spending accounted for just 12% of GDP in Canada and 10% in the UK, but more than 18% in the US just last year. On this point, they also mentioned that a public option would increase wait times. Three responses. The first is that they're cherry picking examples. Some countries with large government healthcare programs such as France and Germany have shorter wait times in the US and a seminal study by the Commonwealth Fund found that there is no statistically significant difference in wait times in the US versus in single payer countries. Second, some wait times are preferable to the infinite wait times for the millions of Americans who do not have access to insurance or forgo care due to cost. Third, even if wait times were to increase, they do not amount to any large-scale harms as the Republicans would have you believe. Remember that Americans rank lower in life expectancy and child mortality than all other developed countries, despite having a large private health insurance system. 
Lastly, in this contention, they mentioned that a public option would affect wait times for all Americans. This is simply untrue. Public option is called an option for a reason. Private insurance will still be available to those who want it, which means the 240 Americans they say have adequate insurance can avoid those wait times should they exist. We don't advocate for a radical socialized system as the Republicans would have you believe. If you don't want to participate in government-run health care, you simply don't have to. Moving on to their second contention about creating a doctor shortage. There are two main problems with this argument. First, they mentioned their example with doctors in the UK. But the problem with the UK's pandemic response was not lack of doctors, but rather Prime Minister Boris Johnson's failure to close public spaces and take precautionary measures. This was a pitfall of leadership, not the healthcare system. American healthcare has also experienced doctor shortages amid the pandemic, despite having a private system. Second, even if doctors' wages were cut, it would remain a highly lucrative field compared to most other occupations, and it's unlikely that people would, who choose the profession to help others would up and leave their workforce simply due to a minor pay cut. Moving on to their third contention where they say that employers will stop providing coverage to their workers. First, this simply isn't true. If private insurance remains preferable, companies who want to attract employees will continue to provide private health care coverage. Second, as explained in our case, when companies don't have to pay for health care, they boost wages 83 cents for every dollar saved, allowing employees to purchase whatever health care plan they choose. Finally, the Republicans say they've passed executive orders to reduce costs, but these actions amount to empty words. President Trump promised we would see the benefits of his executive order to reduce prescription drug costs in August, and two months later, we're left with an empty promise and absolutely no action. The Republicans can talk the talk, but they have not walked the walk. They also mentioned the prices for all drugs decrease under Republican administration. This is factually incorrect. On the whole, the American Association of Retired Persons found the prices of the 500 most prescribed drugs increase an average of 5% this year. And life-saving medications like insulin and EpiPens continue to be priced up to $1,000. Not everyone has access to the discounts they speak of, and these discounts don't apply to all drugs, much less the ones that people need the most. But at the end of the day, let's consider this topic holistically. It's a crying shame that in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, there are 80 million people with inadequate health care who are forced to choose between getting life-saving treatments or having necessities like food and housing. The Republicans would have you do nothing about this while the Democrats offer a solution that benefits all Americans, especially those most in need. Vote to fix our broken health care system. Vote for a healthier America. Vote Democrat. Thank you. Americans have a right to quality health care, but to say that the government is the solution is oxymoronic at best and destructive at worst. Let's explore the Democrats' responses to our positions. First, they tell us that we're fear-mongering and that all of the Republicans' arguments are simply not happening in the status quo. However, our argument remains the exact same. Hard-working people shouldn't be forced to have no choice in their health care and a public option inevitably dooms them. Let's go on to their specific responses. First, on our contention one about uh, taxes and in being increasingly expensive, they tell you that the tax burden is going to fall on the wealthy. Our main response is that hardworking, wealthy Americans shouldn't be forced to pay for government programs. There is no reason why hardworking and wealthy individuals should be forced to pay. But secondly, they tell you that their current spending is unsustainable. We would actually disagree, because in 2020, healthcare premiums decreased for the second straight year. What does that mean? Under a Trump administration, healthcare costs are actually going down in the status quo, which means that the Republican administration is solving back for all of their problems. Then, on their argument about doctor shortages, they tell you that the reason why the United Kingdom had increased wait times was because of the inability of Boris Johnson. Our argument remains the exact same. In the United Kingdom, with a government-run healthcare system, uh, surgical practices have closed down because of the inability to pay for them. In that way, we tell you that 1.9 million United Kingdom citizens have been forced out of medical practices even before the pandemic, which is why government control over healthcare fundamentally fails. But then, on their arguments, they tell you that doctors are still highly lucrative. That's not what we're talking about. What we tell you is that reimbursement rates under a government-run system with doctors would be significantly lower than private insurance, which would price people out and lower wages for doctors. That's really important in today's round because what we tell you is that doctors deserve to be paid at a much higher rate, especially when they're on the front lines of the coronavirus pandemic. For the Democrats to say, oh, they'll manage, is simply wrong. 
But finally, let's go on what President Trump is doing right now. We tell you that in September 13th, President Trump has passed executive orders to lower prescription drug prices. They tell you that we talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. The status quo is really simple. Right now, list prices for drugs may be going up, but because of stuff like rebates and discounts under a Trump administration, prescription drug prices have decreased significantly. That's really important because all of their arguments about access are being solved by Trump and Pence. But then, let's go to their case. First, they tell you that America has a low-life system with terrible health outcomes. But here's the big picture. While they are correct that America has relatively lower life expectancy, that number has only gone up. In the last three decades, American life expectancy has risen by four years, all thanks to the work of our healthcare system, improving thanks to the help of the Republican Party. Also, they're trying to compare the life expectancy of places like America to places like Canada and Iceland, which have a fraction of the population. Stop painting a false picture, Democrats. Then, on their argument about increasing access, if everyone in America had health insurance, does it really matter if there are no doctors to take you in? In a world in which wait times increase exponentially for all 325 million Americans, is that worth a slight increase in the number of uninsured people? Finally, our argument is really clear in that under the Trump administration, healthcare premiums have gone down, which means if anything, the status quo is a world with better access. Then, on their arguments about the economy, their first argument is about job lock, but the primary overarching response is that they don't quantify to you how many people are stuck within their jobs. We would say that this isn't much of a problem in the status quo because the majority of companies right now already have employer-provided coverage. But here's how the Democrats make things worse. As companies see a public option, they figure out a way to cut costs. They're gonna cut their employer-provided health coverage all so that the government could pay for a public option. When the Democrats get up here and say, oh, if you want private insurance, you can get it, that's not what's gonna happen in a world with the Democrats' public option. But finally, on their argument about wages. Again, the Democrats fall into a logical contradiction. They try to paint a world in which people make more money while also making the argument that we tax people with more money at a higher rate. That's not what's gonna happen. They can't have their cake and eat it too. But finally, on their argument about entrepreneurship. Again, the Democrats discredit our amazing economy. Just this year, US News ranked America as the third best country to start a new business because of our technological prowess and our economic power. But secondly, if taxes increase, like the Democrats would have you believe, small businesses would be hit the most because investment in small businesses are done by venture capitalists, stock market investors, and wealthy individuals. The Democrats would make entrepreneurship a living hell because the people they tax are the people who make entrepreneurship possible in the first place. At the end of the day, we both agree that healthcare system needs restructuring, but the Democrats have a public option plan that would cripple the economy and the Americans' right to choose healthcare. Because the Republican administration believes in lowering drug prices, ending surprise billing, and covering pre-existing conditions, we are proud to support a Trump-Pence ballot. Thank you. So why would these companies choose to provide private healthcare when they could just offer public health insurance and cut costs? because privatized healthcare still has its own share of benefits past costs, such as like um, higher, higher skilled surgeons or things of that nature. So public option serves as just that, as people who cannot afford the private option go public. So these benefits that you're saying, doesn't that refute what you have been saying? You're saying that there are more skilled doctors in the private health insurance industry? I, at, at the end, it comes down to waging as far as there are going to be doctors that work privately and doctors that work publicly. And since they work in both places, only people who can afford the private option will have it, just as it is in the status quo. While now, in our world, we'll see a new public option, which everyone can afford. Okay, can we get a question? Yes. Yes. All right, so y'all keep talking about like all these executive orders that Trump is passing. Like, Other than a nice photo op, have they done anything? Yeah, so what we see in the status quo is that the Trump administration actually passed, um, well, they passed a bill that said, or it's actually lowering the prescription drug prices, especially of those generic drugs that you brought up in your case. Um, those prices have decreased by 3.1%. And um, additionally, there's a 50% decrease in name brand drugs. So all throughout the pharmaceutical industry, we see decreases in drug prices in the status quo under the Trump administration. Okay, I mean, the problem with that argument first is that it, the drug, so first of all, drug prices have not decreased. The, Associ the American Association of Retired Persons Evidence we bring up says the price of the 500 most prescribed drugs have increased an average of 5%. But second, what you say about that being attributable to the executive order just isn't true. Trump said he was going to rein in costs 
but that was just like his words. He didn't actually have any action associated with that. Yeah, so what happens here is that the list price actually decreases or increases and the actual price is decreasing. So while on paper you might see an increase in prices, the actual prices that people are paying for these drugs are actually decreasing under the Trump administration. Throughout this debate, the Republicans' entire argument lies on the premise of economics and effectiveness. Also, throughout the entire debate, we Democrats have consistently shown why their arguments are absolutely nonsensical and comparatively insignificant while proving why our stance yields healthier results. Let's have a quick recap to see why a public option is clearly the better option for our nation. Starting with economics, Republicans fail to see the future of their own system. They claim a public option is far too expensive, well, we, which we show is empirically false, without noticing that their own fully privatized healthcare is set to account for half of the entire economy. Yikes. It's also important to remember that almost none of the Republicans' cost-saving plans they bring up in their case have yet to come into fruition. Then they try to further this economic disadvantage by stating that healthcare workers are bound to be severely underpaid. They attempt to do this by bringing up an example that has abs almost nothing to do with healthcare policy, but more about ineffective leadership. But if healthcare professionals are expected to see budget cuts, they would be nowhere near as exaggerated as the Republicans painted out to be, meaning none of their impacts of a doctor shortage will ever be seen with a public option. Now on to effectiveness. The Republicans' biggest claim here is saying that the wait times make um, a public option ineffective. Apparently, Republicans don't quite know how the word option works. Just as my partner said in her last speech, the 240 million who can currently afford private health care will continue to exercise that option because of benefits such as less wait time, while those who can't afford it will now have their own public option which they can afford. Our public option policy accesses all of the benefits our Republican, the Republicans claim to have while ensuring all citizens have some level of health care, a plan far more effective than the status quo. Now let's review why a public option is in our nation's best interest. Economically, we reduce job lock, expand consumerism, increase wages, and benefit small businesses. But let's look past the economics to the most significant factor of all, life. We allow every citizen in the United States to see a doctor. We see humans as humans and not as opportunities to make money, and most importantly, we save the most lives. The choice should be clear. For a better, healthier America, vote Democrat. Thank you. Okay. At the end of the day, drug costs are decreasing and healthcare costs are decreasing under President Trump. The bottom line here is that everyone wants healthcare, but the public option and the democratic implementation only creates more harm than good. Preferred the, Demo preferred the Republican stance for these reasons. While Democrats argue for a cheaper and more efficient system, this is inherently false. A public option only worsens the healthcare system by throwing it onto a government that would increase government spending, increase wait time by multiple weeks, and ultimately fail to efficiently streamline healthcare to millions of Americans. The only impact we see from the public health option is a negative impact on about 240 million Americans. Furthermore, the medical field takes heavy hits from the proposed public option. In a world with this plan, doctors and medical professionals are underpaid and overworked. From what we have seen in other democratic nations, the impact is tens of thousands of doctor shortages and hundreds of medical practices being forced to shut down. The Democrats are proposing a plan that takes away from doctors and in turn hurts millions of Americans across the nation. As former governor of North Carolina, Pat McCrory once told me, if you need a surgery, don't go to the United Kingdom. The fact of the matter is, while the Democrats paint America as a healthcare nightmare, we enjoy the liberty of skilled doctors, lower wait times, and quality care compared to other nations. And it's only getting better with Trump's, President Trump's executive order, reducing the prescription drug prices and lowering medical billing. Finally, President Trump is helping ex expand coverage for pre-existing conditions as we speak. The Republican administration is making healthcare more accessible, better quality, and safer for all of us. A Democratic vote is a vote to doom healthcare, while a Republican vote is a vote of assurance in the best healthcare system in the world. Thus, we strongly oppose a public option. Thank you. 
For decades, we have seen problems with our policing system, lack of police trust, the unjust killings of black men and women, lethal confrontational outcomes that escalated unnecessarily, and too many more. As Kai Wright explained in 2016, we need to start asking why we have so much law enforcement and whether much of it is truly needed. Law enforcement agencies are deeply enmeshed in our daily lives and communities, particularly in communities of color. They are our first responders, they are in our schools, they are immigration officials. For the most vulnerable of us, they, can, they are often what passes for social workers and mental health care providers, and they are armed. It is imperative that we question whether all this law enforcement is necessary and understand how public safety is best served by decreasing the role of police in communities. Vote for Biden-Harris and the Democrats to reduce this outsized role of policing. Firstly, over-policing is detrimental to low-income communities of color. Danica Gordon of Tufts University explains that because police leaders intentionally devote more resources to serve downtown and middle-class neighborhoods, lower-income communities of color are often overlooked as areas worthy of further resource commitments on the one hand and positioned as criminal threats to be controlled and contained on the other. As a result, Policing in predominantly white communities involves police acting as responsive and collaborative service providers who are quick and thorough, while policing in lower income communities of color focuses on intervening in violence with tactics like aggressive investigatory stops. Thus, these communities are over policed when it comes to surveillance and social control, but lack resources when it comes to emergency services. According to a study done by Geller and Fagan in 2014, over policing results in diminished trust between police com and communities, but more trauma and anxiety in the community caused by frequent, unfair, and intrusive encounters with officers. Additionally, over-policing also results in increased use of force. A Andrew Ferguson of the University of District of Columbia in 2018 notes that when officers go to communities expecting crime and viewing people as threats to be controlled, they view routine encounters as higher risk. This makes them dramatically more likely to use force. Thousands of unjust killings of black Americans escalated from scenarios like these. From Atatiana Jefferson in her home to Philando Castile in a traffic stop, encounters caused by the over-policing of communities only led to horrific deaths of people who never deserved it. Reducing the role of police to better engage with these communities, the Democrats' plan would mandate that federal programs explicitly outline how funds should be used and provide assistance to give police better training in de-escalation and nonviolent approaches, peer intervention, and community engagement. Currently, according to the Brennan Center for Justice, funds end up promoting over-policing and over-incarceration. By focusing the allocation of funds to community engagement and de-escalation training, the Wall Street Journal states that after two years of de-escalation training, use of force in Cleveland dropped by 32%. Secondly, we must reduce the role of police because they have been misdirected. The effects of police in mental health and drug issues are harmful instead of helpful. In the status quo, the solution for the violence and addiction caused by drugs has been to inhumanely imprison its victims instead of mitigating the cause. By limiting police solely for their role in preventing violent and property crime, cities would be able to reallocate the funding once designated for arresting drug users towards more productive means of treatment, such as safe injection sites and rehabilitation clinics. Because of this, the U.S. will finally have the systems in place to mitigate the enormous economic impacts of drug use, all while cutting costs associated with overdoses and usage such as emergency room visits, ambulance calls, and treatments. The White House Office of National Drug Control Policy states that every dollar invested in a substance abuse center saves $4 in health care costs and $7 in law enforcement and criminal justice costs. In comparison to spending on addiction treatment, the police use seven times the funds to punish people who shouldn't be punished in the first place. Addiction is an illness, not a crime. The cost of law enforcement and drug 
related issues are astronomical. Drug policy in 2019 finds that each arrest for cannabis costs one to $2,000. This means that with 1.6 million arrests for possession occurring each year, we are currently spending between 1.6 to 3.2 billion dollars a year on arresting people for a nonviolent crime. Our current system also limits our ability to effectively treat addiction, an issue which kills 55,000 Americans every year and costs taxpayers enormous sums of money for a completely ineffectual method. Reducing the role of police under a Biden administration will make our nation more racially just and help us to make progress in the social struggle with drug addiction. It will ease the burdens on our police officers, freeing them to do the work they were most trained to do. Vote for the Biden-Harris ticket and Democrats to bring about the much needed reform. On August 7th, in Peoria, Illinois, 13-year-old boys Jude and Tristan were selling lemonade when they were robbed at gunpoint. When he heard of the incident, their father, quote, almost blacked out. He was just so scared. But a touching scene greeted him upon arrival. Police officers had surrounded the lemonade stand, buying cups of lemonade and paying maybe $20 each for it, trying to make the kids feel safe again. The next day, a parade of police vehicles visited their lemonade stand and made Jude and Tristan feel, quote, so safe and encouraged. From helping these two teenage boys or directing rush hour traffic to investigating domestic disputes and gang violence, police are essential to the safety of society. Therefore, it would be a grave mistake to significantly reduce their presence, especially given the extraordinary circumstances of the present and the policing crisis. Stand with President Trump and the Republican Party to keep our police force strong. A policing crisis is emerging right now. Amid threats to defund the police, the number of applicants has plunged by nearly 70% in some areas. Coupled with a nearly quadruple amount of cops' retirements in the midst of anti-policing protests, it's no wonder 86% of departments report police shortages. To significantly reduce police presence is to effectively abolish them to the detriment of our cities and our laws. First, policing prevents crime. As Matt Yagalas explains for Vox in 2019, more policing increases the risk of getting caught while committing a crime. Crucially, he cites Glick and Tarbrock's 2005 study, which found adding police officers did not control crime by catching and locking up more criminals, but by disincentivizing crime proactively. This deterrent effect is well documented. A 2020 Princeton study reports that the effect of increasing funding to the community-oriented policing services program with the goal of hiring 100,000 new police officers showed, quote, significant effects of, of police on robbery, larceny, and auto theft with suggestive evidence that police reduce murders as well. Numerous other studies corroborate this finding. A meta-analysis by Farrington in 2016 also finds police presence in especially, is especially effective in reducing crime in high crime areas, and that crime is not displaced into neighboring areas at all. Extent, extensive historical analysis of police and crime data from 1960 to 2010 concluded that every $1 spent on extra policing generates about $1.63 in social benefits, primarily through fewer murders. Police not only save lives, but they also unexpectedly, unexpectedly save money. Overall, crime costs Americans over $200 billion annually. Police departments survive on half as much. Thus, removing police presence would undo decades of progress, incentivizing crime at a time when our cities can ill afford it. Second, police enjoy considerable support across all demographics. Given the summer's protests over pro police brutality, it's understandable the problems in the police force have come to a volatile head. However, it's important to remember that a broad cross-section of the public, including black people, are supportive of the police. A 2015 Gallup poll concluded, quote, black adults who believed and believed police treated black people unfairly were also more likely to desire a larger police presence in their local area than those who thought police treated black people fairly. A Vox poll in 2019 found, despite being the racial group with the most unfavorable view of the police, most black people still supported hiring more police officers, the very antithesis of the Democrats' proposed policy. What explains the apparent contradiction? The fact is that the communities which experience more cases of police mistreatment also have greater need for police's crime-reducing capabilities. Indeed, even after the killing of George Floyd, 50% of black respondents still said that we need more cops on the street. 
In a Rasmussen poll conducted on September 17, 2020, 59% of people believe that there is a war on police, 66% 66% of whites, 70% of non-black non minorities, and 84% of blacks worry about its detrimental effects on police presence um, in their communities. Reducing police presence runs counter to the will of the plurality of Americans and would violate the tenets of democracy, not to mention their ability to sleep worry-free at night. Third, reducing police presence may increase police misconduct and use of unnecessary force. Reductions necessitate the remaining police officers work more to address the same, or even an influx, as proved by our first point, amount of crime. This is really important, as what causes police violence is fatigue. A single hour of overtime increased the probability officers improperly used force by 2.7%. Now imagine that amplified across thousands of departments in hundreds of hours of overtime. Furthermore, a 2018 study done by the NCJRS found that if officers work consecutive night shifts, the odds of public complaints increased. Court appearances during daytime further exasper exacerbated their fatigue and the risk of community dissatisfaction. Remember Dr Jude and Tristan? Without the police, they would have lost all their sense of safety after the robbery. But that's exactly what the policy proposal wants, for the most vulnerable people in our communities, our cities, and our nation to suffer from crime without protection. And when the time comes, it won't be a simple lemonade stand robbery. Vote to reelect President Trump and for Republicans to maintain the role of police in our society. So you guys mentioned about how you see a decrease in crime in high crime areas. Where are those high crime areas exactly and who are the people living in those areas? Uh, most of the time, it's like minority communities. OK, thank you. Uh, can we have a question? Sure. OK, so you tell me that like you're going to increase training for police, but you also tell me that you're going to increase or decrease the role of police. So are you doing those thing two things simultaneously or only reducing the role of police? We will be doing both. OK. So our case explicitly outlines that currently in the status quo, what happens is that because there is a higher demand of police service in like higher income neighborhoods in downtown and middle class neighborhoods, what happens is that police service going to those neighborhoods is often more for like community support and often the support that we agree with, that we agree is good. But what happens is that in communities, like in low income minority communities, is that we see police officers who focus on looking for crime. They go into those communities already expecting to find crime. So we reduce the role of police to focus on community engagement rather than like starting in those communities already expecting crime to begin with. Okay, so then how exactly does reducing the role of the police solve for this use of unnecessary force by the police in the status quo? Because a lot of times police are responsible for issues that they should not be responsible for, such as mental health issues and drug issues. And drug issues are a huge factor in this because uh, I believe it's something like 30% of robberies are committed in an attempt to get money for drugs. And so as we read in case, uh, for every dollar we spend on drug treatment, we save $7 in law enforcement costs, meaning it is far more efficient to allocate those funds towards more productive means of treating nonviolent crime. Let's look at the statistic that you read on how um, like uh, communities that are more advantaged, like middle income communities, have a higher demand for police. Um, why would taking away police presence from these um, communities be beneficial for them if they have demand? Sure, so that's a good question. Um, we don't advocate for taking away police from those communities. The argument here, and there seems to be a misinterpretation, is that we advocate for fewer police officers, and that is simply not true. First, there seems to be a big misinterpretation about what the Democrats are actually advocating for. A lot of their cases and arguments relies on the fact that a decrease in police officers and the number of police officers is bad. Understand that this is simply not what we are advocating for. Instead, we are advocating for increased training to allow police officers to focus on community engagement and to focus on what they do best, preventing violent crimes and preventing property crimes. With that being said, the Republicans bring up three key points that unfortunately for them all fall. They first mention that police prevents crime. 
And yes, we agree, to the point that police officers are actually effective and good at preventing violent crimes, that should be part of what police officers do. However, the Republicans claim that crime is decreased in high crime areas, which they explain in Crossfire are lower income communities of color. But at what cost does this decrease in crime come? First, it's important to understand the sort of cycle that happens within lower, community, uh, lower income communities that are over-policed. People commit crimes because of poor socioeconomic conditions, not because of a presence in police. These crimes lead to more arrests, which lead to less productive communities, which in turn and ultimately creates even worse socioeconomic conditions and situations. And this cycle continues with over-policing as a catalyst. Now the communities the Republicans talk about are devastated worse by over-policing. The Republican plan in the status quo only makes the cycle worse. The Democratic plan provides crystal clear benefits that the, Rep the Republicans overlook and ignore. We improve training in de-escalation in community members, uh, excuse me, we improve training in de-escalation in community engagement and improve relationships between police officers and community members while still allowing police officers to enforce the law. In the long run, the Democratic plan actually breaks the cycle I just mentioned. It improves trust relations between police officers and community members and is able to solve the root causes of people's problems when it comes to things like drug and mental health related issues by reallocating funds to invest in community efforts like safe injection sites and rehabilitation clinics. These things are only more efficient and less punitive as every dollar invested in a substance abuse center saves $4 in healthcare costs and $7 in law enforcement and criminal justice costs. Second, the Republicans talk about how police have support of people across demographics, which we think is great. It is good that people are actually trusting the police because we believe that relationships between police and community members are good. However, as I've already stated, we aren't advocating for a decrease in the number of police officers. We support police to the extent that they stop violent crimes and protect communities. But what the Republicans and the evidence they cite fail to recognize is the negative effects of policing beyond what they do best. Finally, the Republicans also talk about how reducing police presence may increase police misconduct and use of unnecessary force. However, this is simply not true. First, because their argument, again, relies on the idea that the Democratic plan will decrease the number of police officers. Again, it does not period. It increases training for conflict de-escalation and nonviolent approaches and narrows the role of police to focus on what they do best in protecting communities, stop violent crimes and property crimes. Past that, the plan does not reduce police presence. Instead, it focuses on police community relationships and prevents police from seeing community members as automatic reasons and threats in places of crime. The Republicans pretty much try to paint this image of the Democratic plan as one that hates police and does not want police at all. Understand that they could not be more wrong. To the point that police officers are good, we agree. That is what the role of police officers should be. However, past that, we believe that a key aspect of our advocacy is that beyond that point, beyond the point that police officers are actually good, is only worse for communities of low income and minority communities, as well as things for drugs and mental health related issues. Police officers, we know, do what they do best. However, what's not included in that role of what they already do best past that is only detrimental for communities that need the most help. Vote for allowing police to focus on what they do best. Vote for allowing people in communities who need the most help to be able to solve the root causes of their problems. Vote Democrat. On their first point of over-policing, they say, don't judge a book by its cover, but let's look at their evidence quickly. The right evidence and the Geller and Fager evidence are both outdated. They failed to account for the extraordinary circumstances of 2020, including riots and economic downturn. You should look towards the study that we cited in our case that said that during times of economic downturn, police presence is especially important as a deterrent against crimes. They also failed to account for the police force's plunge in personnel. Even their mere talk of reform is enough to say that um, police are going to be more likely to retire and they're going to be more likely to not want to be police, contributing to the police shortage we see right now. 
then that's worrying to a majority of, of Americans, including minorities. The Vox evidence on our case finds a majority of minorities, including black people, support hiring more police. And the Rasmussen poll confirms this as well. A shocking 84% of black people worry about their safety given the reduction in police presence. We see under policing in the status quo, not over policing. Now onto their arguments. I have two responses. First, the problem they have identified is an issue with how police approach minority communities not with their roles and certainly not with their presence within them. In fact, statistics show that minority communities still feel safe despite the stated problem of over-policing, which only points to the efficacy of police, as outlined in the first point of our case. In fact, it's naive to assume that minority communities do not experience any violence. They do, and that's why we need police presence. However, the Democrats' policy will not only exacerbate the decrease in police personnel, but it will also decrease the incentives that um, criminals have when they see police to not commit crimes. In fact, from protecting Jude and Tristan from robbery to deterring crimes of all calibers, the role of police as crime stoppers is inextricably connected connected to their presence in communities. Therefore, reducing what they call over-policing would ravage, ravage these communities through the epidemic of violence that will spring from the absence of a deterrent. Because people trade community, community well-being for short-term short -term personal benefits, the costs of um, crime that they see, for example, tangling with the criminal justice system, um, far outweigh the short-term benefits of crime. That's why we need proactive policing that disincentivizes people to commit crimes in the first place. Um, they also say that they're reshaping police's roles, but what they're actually just arguing for is a reduced police presence. Second, the proposed policy of police reform is supported by both parties and not a unique reason to support the Democrats. In fact, the Republican position better implements this training since it provides the same deterrent effect but decreases instances of unnecessary force, whereas the Democratic plan reduces the deterrent effect by curtailing police roles and thus presence. They don't use the training effectively but we see that if we do implement training, which the Republicans are open to doing, we see that police are more likely to interact with their communities, they're likely to help, but we still see the same deterrent effect against violence and nonviolent crime as well. Then on the um, on drugs and the reallocating of funds. You're right to think if this sounds too good to be true. First, drug arrests can easily escalate to violence, something welfare and rehabilitation organizations are ill-equipped to deal with. By putting untrained and unprepared people on the front lines, they risk putting everyone involved in danger, especially since nine out of 10 nonviolent cases usually escalate. We see unnecessary risk with ineffective solution. That's bad. Again, this is a problem of police training and not of their roles as protectors of the community. Second, they encourage the problem they try to address. By reducing the police deterrent, would-be drug users are more likely to use or sell drugs without fear of punishment. Rehab and drug injection sites would increase incentives to use drugs because there's no negative to doing so. However, maintaining police roles as patrol of this type of behavior would because people are afraid of getting caught so they won't do drugs and they won't incur the long-term harms of doing so. And looking to the fact that they increase the amount of drug use that also increases the probability that people get hooked on such drugs and the probability of drug-related violent crimes. The third point is non-adherence because some people simply won't use these sites so we still see the same crimes being committed but without a police presence to address them which further harms the communities we're trying to protect. Remember the Republican platform proactively prevents crime whereas the Democratic platform is merely mitigating at best. Now we've merely we've addressed all of their arguments on uh, their, our case in one fell swoop, but they keep saying that we're not looking at decreasing the number of police. That is strictly false. Let's look at their first point of over policing. The mere fact of over policing is they're saying there's too many police in these neighborhoods, but we see that not only is this not true by the minorities themselves who say that we need more police, but it's also the fact that more police equals more deterrence which is good. Therefore, vote Republican. So Eric, in the first Grand Crossfire, you mentioned that uh, oftentimes you cited maybe 60% of robberies. 30. Uh, how much? 30. 30 uh, accompany drug use? 
Yes. Correct. Um, so then how would a substance abuse counselor that y'all are advocating allocating funds to stop the robbery in the first place? All right, let me uh, give you an example. In Vancouver, obviously suffering with the opioid epidemic, they opened one safe injection site. Contrary to what Laura mentioned in case, it did not increase drug use rates at all. In fact, it decreased drug use rates because out of the population that went to this drug, uh, the safe injection site, 57% sought treatment and 33% subsequently ceased use of heroin entirely. Uh, so help for drug rehabilitation prevents people from using drugs ergo preventing drug-related crime. Okay, so the problem is you completely like misunderstand what Laura tells you. Laura tells you that non-adherence in America, in the majority of American cities and in the majority of American states, is really high. So that's why we would see non-adherence to um, uh, it, like drug abuse centers across America. What? I don't think a higher rate of people using drugs automatically means that empirical studies can be thrown out the window. We can see that things like safe yeah, injection but- sites work and having more people who like use drugs doesn't suddenly mean that safe injection sites won't work. Right, but the argument is that like non-adherence causes even if there's more safe injection sites, non-adherence causes people not to go to those sites. So like those sites aren't really being used. Well, they use them due to geographic proximity and because they do want a safe place to inject these things. Oftentimes when people inject heroin, they're not doing it in the most calm or medically responsible manner. And this, as we've seen, it reduced overdose rates by 80%, reduced HIV rates in Portugal, in the entire country because of their safe injection sites. It reduced HIV infection rates by 95%, hepatitis A, or uh, hepatitis, one of the hepatitis infections by 88%. These things have obvious benefits, and they don't increase crime as we've seen in Vancouver. They don't increase drug use as we've seen in Vancouver and Portugal. In fact, it actually decreased drug use by 20% in Portugal nationwide. Okay, we're kind of getting in the nitty gritty here, but I have a more holistic question. So why can we not have the same presence of the police, but also fund these like drug abuse movements and these rehabilitation centers that you're saying? Like, why are the two mutually exclusive? As we have stated several times, the police use seven times the funds, like, or at least the card itself, oh, we're way over time. One dollar spent on drug rehabilitation leads to seven dollars saved in law enforcement costs, meaning it is far more efficient to treat the causes of these problems as opposed to the symptoms. There are unique benefits as like to doing them both instead of, or there are unique benefits of doing like the advocacy that we explain rather than saying that, oh, you can just do both at the same time. Ultimately, the Democratic and Republican side fundamentally agree on the fact that police serve an important role in disincentivizing violent and property crimes. Now what we tell you is that we better provide for the police in these scenarios by lifting the responsibilities of dealing with drug addictions, by spending the money on more productive sources for treatment for drug addiction, for instance, safe injection sites, which during Crossfire, I listed all the benefits that happen where they're implemented in Vancouver and Portugal. Uh, and it saves quite a deal of money, as we've read, the $1 saves $7 in law enforcement costs, and in addition, $4 in healthcare costs. Uh, so these programs for drug abuse are far more efficient and less punitive and don't punish addiction as a crime, but rather treat it as an illness. And because of this, we better provide for police. As they read in their arguments, fatigue causes a lot of the abuses that we see in the modern world with police officers, uh, police brutality, for instance. Police spend only 20 Four percent of their time on violent and property crimes, and the rest on petty crimes, including drug addiction or uh, drug crimes and similar scenarios. So, in the democratic world in which we are switching the responsibilities of these of these problems away from the police officers towards people who are better able to equip it, we can save lives through reducing infection rates and overdoses, and we can also save the police money by limiting the costs, the massive costs incurred by continuous law enforcement. And in addition, we can also better provide for these low-income neighborhoods, which have a higher drug use rate due to the socioeconomic conditions of the, re- of, the, of the environment. And because of this, in the status quo, we're seeing a cyclical nature of crime in these communities due to the over-policing, whereas if we allow these people who are using drugs to not be arrested and taken away from their families, being taken away from their jobs, and being taken away from being productive citizens, if we simply get them treatment, the thou- hundreds of thousands of people who both die from drugs and get arrested each year can become productive citizens, and thus we better solve for this. 
a couple of reasons as to why you vote for us, right? If you vote for them, you cause a policing shortage. The reason why is if the government tries to reform the police in any way, it would literally accept the idea that police are horrible people and like, um, in, in like all cases provide police brutality and increase the overall negative stigma and contribute to the problem of like retiring officers. But right? again, this literally concedes the idea that um, police decrease and that's why you see in the status quo because of threats of like defunding the police, um, you see that police retire like police retire on significant amounts every single day and you see a hundred fewer applicants um, for a police in the first place. But then we'd say the reasons why you can't vote for them, right? They tell you that like drug abuse overall decreases and you see like drug problems are decreasing in their world and you see that police have less work. However, we would say that they're only incentivizing people to um, go get, get hooked up on drugs. The reason why is they're trying to solve back for the problem in, like when, after they get hooked up on drugs. However, we would say in our world, when you increase police, police and when you, uh, cause, when you have this deterrent effect, you decrease and prevent them from getting hooked up on drugs in the first place. Solving back for that problem, again, they're only literally incentivizing people to get hooked up on drugs because now there's ne no negative effect um, by the law, right? But then we would say that like uh, drug counselors literally cannot Work, work in these situations. The reason why is versatility is cr crucial in these situations, right? Sometimes pe people are like hooked up on drugs and they have access to lethal weapons. This is what causes escalation. That's why we see nine out of 10 cases uh, will escalate into violent situations. That's why versatility is gonna be crucial. Police officers can now act as drug counselors with proper training, but can also act as police officers in uh, preventing and um, providing public safety for everyone that's involved. And lastly, we would say that they try to mention like empirical studies in like Vancouver and Portugal. The problem is in those in those cases, non-adherence is pretty low. But in America, non-adherence is extremely high. Even with the healthcare industry, you see that even if people get prescription drugs, they sometimes don't follow the, follow the things because they literally don't care. And that's why we say that the, you can't really apply those empirical studies to America to America because non-adherence is extremely extremely high in America. Again, at the point where they agree that policing shortage. Is, is, is bad, you're going to vote for the Republican side because we prevent a policing shortage which could have long-term implications on America. James Gilligan, former director of the Center for the Study of Violence at Harvard Medical School, states that every 15 years, on average, as many people die of relative poverty as would be killed in a nuclear war. And every single year, two or three times as many people die from poverty throughout the world as were killed by the Nazi genocide. At the dawn of a new millennium, poverty remains the greatest environmental destruction across the greatest cause of environmental destruction across the globe. It is because the American economy's ability to lift both its own citizens and millions of people around the world out of poverty that stand with President Trump and the Republican Party. Resolved, when in conflict, the United States should prioritize economic growth over environmental regulation. The US will promote economic growth and reduce poverty through three different mechanisms. The first way to prioritize economic growth is through infrastructure investment. Democrats have stymied infrastructure investment for decades with needless layers of bureaucracy and endless environmental reviews. Ginger Gibson and David Shepardson in January 2018 that President Trump's infrastructure plan consisting of 200 billion in federal investment will spur at least 1.5 trillion dollars in total investments to rebuild our failing infrastructure and develop innovative projects. This infrastructure investment is critical in boosting economic growth, as model of IIT finds that 1% growth in infrastructure spending is associated with 1% growth in growth in per capita GDP and 0.7% annual uh, reduction in poverty. It will also fight ri rising unemployment rates. As Nicole Smith, chief economist at the Georgetown Center in January 2017 quantified, if enacted, Trump's infrastructure program would create more than 11 million jobs. The second mechanism is a pro-growth tax code. President Trump's plan call for reducing taxes on capital gains, the middle class, and also other companies. Trump's last tax cuts were widely successful in spurring economic growth, as CEA calculations in 2019 estimated real disposable personal income per household rose by about $6,000 since President Trump's last tax cuts were signed into law. Workers across all income groups, income groups also saw their wages rise. According to the Council of Economic Advisors in 2019, blue collar wages rose 3% annually from January 2017 through November 2019. The lowest wage earners saw the fastest nominal wage growth of 11% of any income group since the tax cuts were enacted. And the third mechanism that President Trump will use to promote economic growth is deregulation. Our party's Platform states, we support the cost-effective development of renewable energy sources, those being wind, 
solar, biomass, biofuel, geothermal, and tidal energy by private capital. Prior prioritizing economic growth will make this possible. We urge the private sector to focus its resources on the development of carbon capture and the sequestration technology. Steady economic growth brings the, techn the technological advances which make environmental progress possible. We firmly believe environmental problems are best solved by giving incentives for human ingenuity and the development of new technologies, not through a top-down command and control regulation style that stifle economic growth and cost thousands of jobs. Together, these approaches work at home and abroad. The Census Bureau reports, during President Trump's administration, 6.6 .6 million Americans were lifted out of poverty. This was the largest three-year reduction to start any presidency since the initial drop that began the war on poverty in 1964. Coes of Vox EU in February 2017 estimates a 1% increase in US growth could boost growth in advanced economies by, uh, by 0.8% and an emerging market and developing economies by at least 0.6%. The benefits of prioritizing economic growth are twofold. First, it reduces the outbreak of infectious diseases. By spurring population growth, contributing to immune compromising malnutrition and exacerbating crowding and uh, poor living conditions, poverty also fuels tr the transmission of disease. Almost two million people will die this year of tuberculosis and another, and another nearly four million from lower respiratory infections, most of whom live, live in poor, crowded areas of the developing war world um, and these communicable diseases are muting, mutating dangerously and spreading to other regions. Second, prioritizing economic growth today ultimately protects the environment tomorrow. Hollander of UC Berkeley explains, impoverished people often plunder their resources, pollute their environment, and overcrowd their habitats. They do these things not out of willful neglect, but simply out of the need to survive. They are well aware of the environmental amenities that affluent people enjoy, but they also know that for them to journey to a better environment, uh, that, will take a long, or that will take a long time, and their immediate goal is to escape from, po from the clutches of poverty. Lack lacking the resources to avoid degrading their environment, their struggle for daily survival often leaves no choice. What is primarily at risk for them is less the environment than their lives itself. To protect the environment, we must first protect our people. Only a vote for Trump and the Republican Party will prioritize economic growth right now in this time of crisis. Support Republicans up and down the ballot on November 3rd. In 2020, we stand at a crossroads. If we choose to take action now, we can mitigate the climate crisis, or we can stand by and watch the world burn. One of the key reasons that Republicans fail to take action against climate change is the fear that action will harm the economy. However, they cling to zombie industries that should have decomposed and died years ago. What they fail to realize is no matter what the short-term economic growth is, climate change will kill the economy and millions of people along with it. The Biden-Harris administration recognizes the existential risk posed by, the cli uh, by climate change and they have provided, a de provided detailed steps and policies to all but eliminate this crisis. That's why we negate today's resolution, that when in conflict, the United States should prioritize economic growth over environmental regulation. Currently, we see carbon emissions skyrocketing at an alarming rate. Emissions have jumped up 41% in the last three decades. The United States is the second largest producer of CO2 aggregate carbon emissions, surpassed only by China. We cannot pretend we are not the problem. Biden's plan centers on achieving a 100% clean energy economy by 2050 by investing $1.2 trillion over the next 10 years. The plan takes five key steps in order to achieve this goal. Increasing investment in renewable energy, electric vehicles, clean manufacturing, clean farming, and rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement. There are two key advantages to prioritizing environmental regulation, the first of which is preventing looming human death and suffering. Climate change is not a far-flung issue that we can deal with in the future. Rather, inaction now will become entirely disastrous. 
If the world continues producing at our current rate, our environment will collapse. Billions of people will become climate refugees, and the human race could cease to exist within the next century. We must change our behaviors now, or else we will not be able to preserve our Earth. NASA furthers that sea levels will rise up to eight feet, engulfing coastal cities and forcing millions to leave their homes. Natural disasters such as hurricanes and droughts will become even more severe and frequent. The, a 2018 World Bank study found that without co concrete climate action, over 143 million people from Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America will be forced to migrate, effectively becoming climate refugees by 2050. The UN found in 2018 that we had only 12 years left to solve climate change. Two years have passed, and we have seen little to no progress. We need to act now before it is too late. If we continue at our current rate, the Natural Resources Defense Council explains that through hurricane damage, real estate losses, and energy costs, climate change comes with a price tag of $1.9 trillion annually by 2100. We are almost out of time. The Biden Clean Energy Plan gives us goals to work toward to fix the problems that are destroying our world. The second advantage of prioritizing environmental regulation now is that even if it results in a short-term economic trade-off, the long in the long term, the economy booms. The fossil fuel industry is dying, and it is only supported by billions of dollars in subsidies. In fact, only half of US oil investments are profitable without subsidies. Yet, even without government support, renewable energy is already more cost-efficient and cheaper than fossil fuels. Switching to renewable energy creates thousands of jobs, builds new plants, and redirects billions of tax dollars to other climate policies. A recent report by the International Renewable Energy Agency shows that just doubling the amount of renewables used will grow the economy by $1.3 trillion, driven by the increased investment in renewable energy deployment and rippling throughout the economy. Most importantly, Biden's new plan entailed switching to a 100% clean electricity economy by drastically increasing renewable energy and efficiency tax credits, while implementing an aggressive methane emissions tax and requiring public companies to disclose greenhouse gas emissions. Furthermore, the Biden Clean Energy Plan would provide over 10 million jobs in the long run. Any jobs lost in the fossil fuel industry would be replaced by this massive surge in high-paying jobs. Even more, the Biden administration hopes to reach their goals by 2050, stipulating gradual change over, over time, removing any possibility of sudden catastrophic economic collapse. The climate crisis threatens every single person on this planet. Biden's plan will cut carbon emissions, decrease air pollution, and help mitigate the damage by, caused by increasingly severe climate disasters, saving trillions of dollars and thousands of lives. We cannot make decisions based on short-term economic fear. A vote for Biden and the Democrats is a vote for saving our planet while we still can. So in your case, you say that there will be $1.2 trillion in investment in this new project. Will that be public or private investment? And if it is public, where will that money come from? In his plan, Biden uh, recommends that we can get some of that money from taxing the rich. And there's also going to be a leftover amount of money. If when we switch to removals, we will remove fossil fuel subsidies, which um, currently amount to around over $300 billion as well. And regardless, we would say in the long term, even if there's a short term economic drawback and we have to get this money from somewhere, in the long term, the economy booms. And it's not a question of when we're going to do this. It's a, it's a question of when we're going to do it, as in we have to do it at one point. Can I ask a question? So in your case, you talk a lot about um, increased infrastructure investment. doesn't matter what kind of infrastructure or what infrastructure in, say, green energy, clean energy account for these benefits as well. Um, so most of Trump's planned infrastructure is like highways, roads, uh, wastewater, like treatment plants. So we would say that that type of investment will benefit the American people more than investment 
directly into clean energy. Why? Because, like, when these rural communities get these new resources, it lifts those people out of poverty, whereas, like, shifting to clean energy this quickly will only drive up prices, create energy poverty, and ultimately, like, the money will have to come from American taxpayers. Former Vice President Joe Biden's plan for a clean energy revolution and environmental justice incorporates most of the environmental and economic policies outlined in the Green New Deal. While transitioning to a 100% clean energy economy by 2050 may sound appealing, it is largely infeasible for five overarching reasons. The first is because of the unbearable cost. The Heritage Foundation in 2019 estimates it would require more than $5 trillion to switch to 100% renewables by 2050. The transition would also result in an aggregate GDP loss of over $15 trillion by 2040. Second, because of the greater regulation, there would be a shift to external markets. Loris of the Heritage Foundation in 2019 explains, policies that limit coal, oil, and natural gas production will not stop the global consumption of these natural resources because production will merely shift to places where regulations are not as rigorous. Third, because of a massive amount of land is required to expand renewable power. Keith of Harvard University in 2018 finds, meeting the country's present day electricity demand would require covering one third of the continental US with wind turbines. Not only do we not have the space for this, but it would exacerbate global warming. Keith furthers, if large-scale wind farms were to be built to meet electricity demand, it would warm average surface temperatures in the US by 0.24 degrees Celsius. Given the expectation that wind farms would continue to expand as the w demand for wind-derived electricity increases, interactions and associated environmental impacts could not be avoided. The fourth is because we will never be able to fully phase out fossil fuels. Rhodes of Yale University in 2018 reports, US hydroelectric energy delivers power only 138 days of the year, wind turbines only 127 days, and solar electricity only 92 days. Because renewable energy relies on natural processes that are not always guaranteed, we will need to keep fossil fuel power stations running as backup power sources, mitigating the effects that a transition to renewables would have. The fifth is through creating energy poverty. The National Bureau of Economic Research reports cheaper home heating because of America's fracking revolution averts more than 10,000 winter deaths per year. Biden's policies would wipe all of that away and reverse course by mandating pricier energy on families. Diaratno of the Heritage Foundation in 2019 predicts that new regulations to incre will increase household electricity expenditures by 30% and cause a total income loss of more than $165,000 for a family of four. In the beginning of their case, the Democrats discussed the issue of rising emissions. However, even if Biden's plan was feasible, it still would not have a substantial impact. Diaratna explains that even if the US were to cut CO2 emissions by 100%, the world would only be less than 0.2 degrees Celsius cooler by 2100, and sea level rise would only be slowed by less than two centimeters. Now I will address the two main points the Democrats present in their case. Their first point is that prioritizing environmental regulations will prevent death. The Democrats cite a 2018 UN report saying that we have 12 years to solve for climate change. But if their own plan to shift to renewables cannot be completed until 2050, they fail to meet their own time frame. It is clear that climate change is already here. Rice of Wired explains, climate change is functionally inevitable, with any climate reduction coming too little too late. CO2 already in the air and in the pipeline will stroke irreversible warming for the next thousands of years. Wells of New York Magazine in 2019 writes, even under best case emission reduction, climate change will kill 153 million people from air pollution's health impacts alone. Rice furthers, rather than setting vague climate targets, it is necessary to help developing nations adapt to inevitable warming and biophysical hazards. Economic growth is crucial. As Desai of the Global Humanitarian Forum quantifies, developing nations suffer 150 times more GDP loss and experience 99% of the deaths due to climate change. At the point where their own energy goals cannot solve for climate change in time, we must prioritize economic growth and adaptation to save the most lives. Their second point is that prioritizing environmental regulation will create long-term economic growth. 
the Democrats claim that doubling renewables will grow the economy by $1.3 trillion and create 10 million jobs. Even if they were to fully implement their plan and access these impacts, prioritizing economic growth will still outweigh. President Trump's infrastructure plan alone will create more than 11 million jobs and spur $1.5 trillion in total infrastructure investment. Coupled with pro-growth tax code and deregulation, the economy will continue to boom. These policies have already reduced poverty. As the Census Bureau reports, pre during President Trump's administration, 6.6 .6 million Americans have been lifted out of poverty. As Loris of the Heritage Foundation concludes, by shrinking our economy by potentially tens of trillions of dollars, Biden's environmental policies will cause lower levels of prosperity and fewer resources to deal with whatever environmental challenges come our way. That's a bad deal for our economy and our environment. The democratic argument is crystal clear. We say that one, climate change is an existential risk. As we mentioned in case, the UN reports that we only have 10 years left to take step towards solving the climate. If we don't do this, there's gonna be hundreds of millions of climate refugees and an increase in the severity and frequency of natural disasters. Two, we argue that in the long term, Biden helps the economy with his um, climate change plan. My opponents make a couple of answers, a couple of responses. First, they talk about the cost, but it's crucial to understand that the cost of renewables is currently decreasing. And without fossil fuel subsidies, as we mentioned in our case, renewables would naturally surpass. Second, Daniel Carrington from The Guardian explains that coal, oil, and gas get more than $370 billion a year in support compared with $100 billion for renewables. The International Institute for Sustainable Development furthers that only 10 to 30 percent of the fossil fuel subsidies would pay for a global transition to clean energy. And regardless of the cost, we need to make steps towards solving climate change. The alternative is literally trillions of dollars and millions and millions of deaths. Second of all, they talk to a shift to external markets. However, two responses. One, in the US, companies will not be allowed to make these shifts. As Biden mentions in his plan, they're gonna, he's gonna monitor the amount of fossil fuels that these companies produce. Second, Biden will rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement, which will enforce worldwide cooperation. Three, they talk about the land. Two responses. One, offshore wind is extremely viable, which doesn't take up land. And second, there's plenty of options for solar panels. In fact, a Forbes article just last year mentioned how solar panels are becoming increasingly popular to put it underwater, removing the issue of land. Second, next, she talks about how we can't have renewables. Two responses. Dissendor from Renew Economy explains that right now, the USA can run on 90% renewable energy. Second, Meredith furthers that in Germany, they're able to function with 100% renewable energy. That's extremely important because the impacts she talks about don't actually materialize. Next, she talks about energy poverty. But remember, she's overestimating the cost of renewables as they're decreasing right now, and once again, the impact she talks about doesn't materialize. Now, onto her own case. First, it's crucial to understand that climate change worsens poverty. That's super important and a reason why you actually, her case is actually a reason to vote for the Democrats. We would argue that one, climate change destroys arable land, increasing hunger, and causes hundreds of millions of climate refugees, poverty is only going to get worse. So if you want to take steps to address poverty, it's a clear democratic ballot. Next, my opponents say how we don't meet our own time frame. However, what you have to understand is that essentially what they're doing is they're giving up. They'll say, it's too late. We're just not going to do anything. You have to understand that anything is better than nothing. And second of all, they misunderstand the evidence that we present to you. We say that we have 10 years to start climate action. That doesn't mean the whole problem needs to be solved within 10 years. It means that if we don't do anything in 10 years, it will be too late. Next, then they make the argument that they're gonna, um, that 
In their world, there's 11 million jobs with Trump's new plan. However, what you have to understand is that the Biden Clean Energy Plan provides over 10 million well-paying jobs. Sure, there might be a difference of 1 million jobs, but in the grand scheme of things, that doesn't really matter, and it doesn't have any impacts that they talk about. Especially since right now, because of COVID, the great booming economy that she talks about isn't here anymore. Now is the time to implement Biden's uh, clean energy plan to better the, better the economy and better the environment. If you vote for the Republicans, you're giving up. You're, th you're, you're giving up, and you're not actually going to do anything to solve climate change. Thank you. I hate him here. So you guys talk about, like, in your case, about human ingenuity, but has this so-called human ingenuity uh, created any substantial decrease in emissions? Yeah, I mean, the private sector is already starting to do that. When you see companies like Amazon, uh, a major corporation, by the way, that pledges to go emission-free totally by 2040 uh, with no government regulation in that whatsoever. Um, how are you supposed to know if they actually achieve that if we aren't forcing them to publicly release their carbon emissions? I think they would choose to if that's their pledge. I mean, wouldn't you say that they choose to based on the narrative that the Democratic side presents about climate change? Because I would say if Trump is saying that it's fake, then people aren't gonna have incentive to make that human ingenuity switch. I mean, we think that even if Trump says it's fake, most of these business leaders know that it's real. And so if they have the money to and they want to prioritize reducing the emissions of their company and their production, then they can choose to do that in a free market. As you mentioned yourself, Amazon is a huge corporation. How will other corporations manage to make a similar change? The same way Amazon does. But if they don't, they're not a huge corporation, they don't have those resources. That's why you have to have capital first. That's why we would advocate for economic growth so they can afford to do so. Okay, so I have a question about the time frame which you mentioned in your case. So um, th you keep on uh, talking about how climate change is a very pressing issue and that we need to like solve it now. However, your plan is only going to take place in 30 years. So are you going to let you know the most the poorest, the most marginalized who are living in poverty suffer while you try to deal with like the impacts that you talked about in your case? No. So as I mentioned in rebuttal, we make two key arguments. One, essentially what you're doing is giving up and doing nothing. That's worse. Two, the 12 years is 12 years to make action to do something. And three, poverty only worsens with climate change. Climate change is gonna worsen poverty, so if you actually wanna alleviate poverty in like the long term, you're gonna wanna first focus on climate change. The Democratic Party can only result in the worst of both worlds, a worse off economy and a failed plan to combat climate change. Uh, let's talk about climate change first. The radical plan to switch to renewable energy may sound appealing, but they forget to mention the impossibly high cost of over $5 trillion that's going to shift production away from the U.S. and towards other countries, which is going to harm millions of U.S. jobs and increase emissions rates. Um, plus, we don't physically have the resources to cover a large-scale shift to renewable energy, much less a 100% shift. They gave the examples of using underwater uh, solar panels. However, that technology is um, and more like that is only going to come in the Republican world where we encourage uh, investment in research um, by companies like Amazon into developing cost-effective ways of switching to renewable energy and developing that technology further. The Democrats, the Democrats talk about how climate change must be solved within 12 years, but the best they can do is hope that their policies are implemented in 30 years, which is well over their own time frame, and it is time where people who are, going to, who, who are living in poverty are going to be suffering. Instead, look towards President Trump's plan. Prioritizing uh, economic growth ultimately leads to the protection of the environment tomorrow. He will decrease the regulations on the renewable energy sector, which will not only increase jobs, but allow for private investment and research in a cost-effective development of renewable energy sources. Economic growth is crucial for allowing developing countries to deal with the effects of climate change. We are the ones who provide realistic, cost-efficient strategy of switching to renewable energy and help develop uh, and help developing countries uh, adapt to the effects of climate change. So prefer this over the, over the Biden's plan. Now let's look towards the economy. Our priority is towards the American people. And we serve them well by creating over 11 million new jobs through infrastructure investment, while Biden's plan will only create 10 million and, as, and outsource jobs from the renewable energy sector to other countries. 
In addition to creating more jobs than Biden, President Trump tax cuts will increase wages across America, improving the benefits of these jobs that Democrats don't do. They constantly bring up the issue of lives, but you have to remember that poverty kills millions through disease and energy poverty, which is more than the deaths from climate change. Trump has worked, uh, has, uh, worked to lift 6.6 .6 million Americans out of poverty through tax cuts and will continue to do so, saving even more lives. Biden can only offer unrealistic plans that have gaping holes in them, leaving the American people stranded with a suffering economy. Trump will champion infrastructure investment, decrease taxes, and call for deregulation to not, alone, to not only increase more jobs and save more lives than Biden, but ultimately re reduce climate change as well. We vote Republican here. Yikes. The, the Republican Party offers no reliable solutions to the worsening effects of climate change. The Trump administration has not supported countless organizations that have tried to stop climate change. For example, the Paris Agreement or in Trump's EPA or Environmental Protection Agency poised to scrap the Clean Power Plan. This not only hurts efforts to stop climate change, but it makes it abundantly clear Trump's position on climate change. Instead, they hope that human in uh, ingenuity would be able to solve all these problems in a short amount of time. Yet they have not provided any human ingenuity that substantially decreased emissions. It is unwise to gamble the lives of millions on the hope that human ingenuity alone would be able to solve this complex issue in such a short amount of time with such little results. Only the Democratic Party has a concrete plan to lower emissions and to stop climate change. The, Re the Republican Party says that we cannot achieve this in the little time frame we have given. But Biden achieves this by switching to renewable energy, which will lessen emissions. When we lessen emissions, the amount of time we have to solve the problem increases because we're reducing the amount of harmful gases released. This is important because Biden's plan of having net zero emissions by 2050 is achievable. When we implement renewable energy, this reduces the, de the detrimental effects of climate change, like more frequent natural disasters and rising sea levels. Switching to renewable energy over a period of time will create millions of jobs while allowing the transition to be as harmless as possible. Furthermore, without actions, uh, without dealing with climate change, uh, it will cost $1.9 trillion annually. We must look to this plan because it solves issues of climate change while increasing job opportunities. Today, we must vote for the Democratic Party because they offer an achievable solution for climate change, which will save millions of lives, while also uh, improving inf infrastructure by providing jobs. This is, op this is an optimal solution because it saves the most lives and prevents the most consequences in the future in the safest way. While the, while the Republican Party offers only a risky gamble to solve the serious consequences of climate change, while also removing the United States from multiple efforts to stop climate change, the Republican Party says that they increase jobs, which reduces poverty, and that when Biden switches to, to renewable energies, we cause an increase of poverty, which will kill millions. This is simply untrue because we are creating jobs that replace the ones that, that, uh, that we have lost, and when we implement it over a number of years, the impacts will be minimal and worth solving because of the destruction climate change will cause. For these reasons, Biden's policies save the most lives and help the economy in the long run instead of a risky gamble and a short fix. Hello, I am Carol Hill Williams, Chair of the Mecklenburg County Board of Elections. Thank you, Charlotte Latin, for inviting me to be a part of this very important community event. The purpose of a debate is for candidates to inform voters of their positions on various important issues. You have had your debate. You have heard both sides of the aisle. Now it is up to you to determine who you will vote for. And more importantly, if eligible, to go out and cast that vote. As chair, it is very important to me that we provide safe and adequate voting locations so that every resident has an opportunity to go out and cast their vote. I am pleased to say that as a board, we have established 33 early voting sites. I encourage you to go out and vote, and I also ask that you encourage your parents, relatives, and friends to go out and exercise their right to vote. Early voting began Thursday, October 15th, and will continue until Saturday, October 31st. During early voting, there is an opportunity to same day register and vote. If you're 17 and you will be 18 by or before election day, Tuesday, November 3rd, you are also eligible to same day register and vote. Proof of residency is required. For a list of documents that you can present for proof, please contact the Board of Elections at 704 
336-2133. You may also visit our website at mecboe.org, M-E-C-K-B-O-E dot O-R-G. So I encourage you to go out and vote. Do not stay at home. Your vote is very important. The power of the vote is in your hands. You are the future. And please be safe and wear your mask.